Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing that temperance nugget with us. And uh, not only for our children, but for the rest of us, uh, it's always good to keep in mind to stay, uh, stay balanced in all that, we, all that we do. As we b- begin, I want to um, point out a couple of books. I don't know, you, how many of you happen to have this book, Tell It to the World, by C. Mervyn Maxwell? Several of you do, not um, as many as I might wish. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, C. Mervyn Maxwell, was one of my uh, professors when I was in, at college and um, grew to really appreciate him and his, his teaching skills, his storytelling skills. He is a son of Uncle Arthur, who wrote the Bible story and bedtime stories um, many years ago. But uh, he's a very interesting storyteller, or was, and so... Um, This is one of the books that is going to be one of my primary references or source for the material I'm sharing with you today. Uh, The other one that I brought is a book by Arthur L. White. He was a grandson of Ellen White, and uh, he wrote a series of six volumes. This is the first of those volumes. Uh, on the life of Ellen White and the development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, This one is called The Early Years. It's the first volume of that set. How many of you happen to have this set of volumes, or at least this first volume? Okay, I see one, two, a couple of hands. I would encourage you uh, to acquire them if you don't already have them. Uh, Excellent material, Uh, Arthur White, I've had classes from him as well, and um, he's an interesting person and has had many memories to share of his grandmother, Ellen White. And so the message I'm sharing with you today, it was brought to my attention, uh, actually I had something else intended uh, when I was thinking about this weekend. Last Sabbath, somebody mentioned to me, We very seldom have anything presented in our worship services regarding uh, the development of Adventist um, beliefs, Adventist teaching. And so I thought maybe today, uh, since we're starting the Zoom program, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, uh, but um, I looked over the material, you, the outline you sent, and I says, I don't think that'll overlap too much. And perhaps if it does, it, it's a good overlap. But I want to share uh, a development, and this actually happened before uh, we were organized as a Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Uh, our story comes out of the 1850s, and so our church name really was established just in the early 1860s. And so 1850s, uh, there were Sabbath-keeping Adventists, and there were many Adventists that were, uh, they were Sunday-keeping Adventists. Adventists believe in the coming of what? In the coming of Jesus. And so William Miller, who had preached, in fact, there's some fascinating stories about William Miller that um, uh, maybe sometime we can take a look at as well. But uh, William Miller was a Baptist. He would have fit real well into our community here because there are a lot of Baptists here. Willie Miller, uh, at, for a long time, was known as a deist where he believed that there was a God who had uh, initiated the creation of the world, He kind of like a big bang by God, and then left it all to happen on its own after that. Uh, he was a deist. And uh, it was quite, uh, it was a number of years later that he finally uh, gave his life to Jesus Christ and became active again in the Baptist church. And he, um, uh, he studied and studied his Bible. He loved to read, but he had very little schooling. And he taught himself. He borrowed just about every book he could out of the community in which he lived and read these uh, different authors and read the Bible and um, so um, 
Anyway, there were the people that began to believe as he did, and William Miller believed that Jesus would come in the year 1844. Uh, after studying the prophecies of Daniel and then comparing them with Revelation, he believed that he had pinpointed that time of the cleansing of the sanctuary to 1844, and he believed that this earth was the sanctuary. It was going to be cleansed by fire at the second coming of Jesus. Well, these the people that believed and accepted his teachings, they were Methodists and Presbyterians and uh, um, Baptists and uh, Pentecostals. And there were groups of people from many different denominations that came to believe as he did and believed that Jesus was going to come. Well, we are aware now that Jesus did not physically come to this earth in 1844. And October 22 came to be known as the day of disappointment, the great disappointment. So many Christians believed Jesus would come that very day, and when he didn't, their hearts were broken. Well, out of that group of believers, as they continued to study the Bible, they began to develop uh, teachings that came from the Scripture and people gathered together, and one of the teachings they learned was the teaching of the Seventh-day Sabbath being on Saturday. They actually learned it from a Baptist. Rachel Oaks Preston was a Seventh-day Baptist. And so uh, there developed to be a group. Uh, at first, it was small, only a handful. Uh, James and Ellen White were part of these believers, and um, they, they loved the Lord. And in the 1850s, it was just a fledgling little group. Uh, these Adventists had started a publishing house known as the Review. I think it had a fuller name uh, at that time, the Advent Review. And Sabbath Herald, I believe, was the name of the magazine that was produced. But they also published a lot of other things. And so, from the beginning, these Sabbath-keeping Adventists saw themselves with a purpose. They believed that God had called them to share uh, the things they had learned with the people of the world, and uh, that they believed that they were the church of the last days. And so uh, they believed that God was calling them to, to be like the Israelites who went you know, to Mount Sinai, and they were given the Sabbath, and, and they learned that, and they were to carry it to the world. Well, they believed that they were modern-day Christians on their way from the Babylonian Egypt uh, of modern times, and God had called them out to share the Sabbath truth and other basic Bible truths with the people of the world. And so uh, they were on their way to the heavenly Canaan as God was teaching them. Turn in your Bible with me to Revelation, the third chapter. We'll be sharing from uh, the book of Revelation primarily and then from the writings of some of these uh, early Adventist church leaders uh, today. Revelation 3 and verse 8, they, uh, they were directed to read in Scripture about the messages John wrote to the seven churches. There were seven churches in Asia Minor that he wrote to, and the sixth of those seven churches was a church by the name of Philadelphia. It meant brotherly love. And so let's read just a little bit about it in verse 8, Revelation 3 and verse 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength have kept my word and have not denied my name. Drop down to verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
And these Sabbath-keeping Adventists, they looked at themselves and they said, you know, we are that church of Philadelphia. Just look at the warm fellowship we have when we come together. We love each other. Just notice how we love the truth of God's word. And they did. And they said, that really applies to us. We are the ones, the church of Philadelphia. Now, in the process of looking at themselves, they also looked at the other Adventists who did not observe the Sabbath and had not accepted the Sabbath. And they said, you know, really the designation of the last church or the seventh church that John writes to, the church of Laodicea, that one refers to these non Sabbath-keeping Adventists. They are the ones. And they haven't really fully accepted the truth of the Bible. And uh, they, they just are not as consecrated as we are. Well, there were not very many Sabbath-keeping Adventists in those days, but it was growing, and James White uh, was working at this publishing house. It was a small place. Um, and according to some of the letters that came in to James there at the review, as it was known, um, James determined that, you know, the church was growing. The membership and the, and the, uh, the readership of the review was growing. And from just a handful, they had now about 2,000 subscriptions. And so there was... There was some growth just there in the first two or three years of the 1850s. Um, but as numbers increased, it seemed as though their spirituality diminished. Sometimes as the church grows and grows rather rapidly, uh, not everybody is dedicated. And so as things begin falling apart, um, even some of the ordained ministers at that time dropped out of preaching. And they went to farming and taking care of their own businesses and building houses and, and uh, looking after other things. Among them was a man by the name of Washington Morris and another man, Horace uh, Lawrence. Um, and as these ministers stopped preaching, and went about their business, they, of course, had an influence on other Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping Adventists who said, well, you know, it's not all that important to them. We want to be prosperous, too. And so they began investing themselves in their own businesses and in their own farms and, and doing things, um, the review office, as they publish these things, tracks and booklets started stacking up by the thousands, and nobody was passing them out, giving them to the multitudes, to the people in the towns and communities. Now, even these Adventists were not reading them as they should. A great debt was being accumulated by the publishing uh, house there. Now, these Adventists, they didn't commit murder, they didn't rob a bank, but for people who were preparing to meet Jesus, um, they were in a sorry shape. Uh, just a little example of that, um, now let me share a couple of excerpts from what James White put in a, in a little... Um, um, what do you call it, an editorial. This was, I think, in the year of 1856. Just to give you an example, people would write in, or he had this little, in this editorial, he would say, people would say, I want to stop my paper, the, the review, from coming to their house. I, I, I'm not able to pay for it. I like the paper, but I'm just too poor. And then he inquire, uh, responded, well, let me inquire, do you use tea 
and coffee and tobacco. Oh, yes, they said, we do use these things. We've used them for a long time, and the habit has become strong, and I don't think it's a sin to use these daily comforts that taste so well. But James says, how can you get them? You're so poor. You can't even pay $2 for 52 issues of the review to come to your home. $2 for a whole year. You can't afford that. How can you afford tea and coffee and tobacco? And they says, well, we think we must have tobacco and tea and coffee. Uh, and we raise the money somehow. So that was the, con uh, the condition of many of the uh, folks there in the early 1850s. They really hadn't come to a conviction yet about temperance and healthful living and being careful about the things that we put into our bodies. And so uh, it just gives you a little example of a way, the way things we're going. And I think unintentionally, James White contributed to the problem. He had been criticized. Chastain mentioned in Sabbath school, having a time in her nursing career where she was criticized for you know, things that weren't true. And it can be devastating. Well, James White, instead of stopping publishing, he responded in a different way because people were accusing him that all these things he was teaching in the review, they were a result of his wife's imagination. That Ellen White was coming up with these doctrines about the Sabbath and the state of the dead and the sanctuary, that they were Ellen White's doctrines that he was promoting. And so James White, taking this criticism very personally, perhaps, perhaps quite honestly, he stopped publishing anything she wrote. He just really cut it down to a very minimum in the Adventist Review. And in fact, her visions, those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, know that Ellen White had a number, many, in fact, visions through the years, and she would publish these things and share them with people. The visions diminished during this time. And... Um, and so uh, she would give heartfelt appeals, but they weren't being included in the review. People weren't listening. Well, another thing happened. They moved the publishing house from Rochester, New York, to Battle Creek, Michigan. Not everybody was happy about that. You know, change is never easy. And it isn't for Christians today either, but it wasn't then. And so there was criticism because they had moved and relocated the, uh, the publishing house as small as it was, had relocated it to, Bering, uh, to uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. And, uh, and so uh, there were, seemed to be a diminished spirituality among uh, these Sabbath-keeping Adventists. Uh, those in Battle Creek, a group there, began praying that God would work a revival in their lives. And they prayed and prayed. They met together in their houses and in their small churches and, and um, in their barns sometimes, praying that God would do something special. And um, then a testimony came out. Ellen White wrote her first testimony for the church. It was 16 pages long. And, and the, the people agreed to to sponsor that, pay for it to be sent out in the mail to individuals. Uh, it was testimony number one. It was just the beginning of 36 testimonies that came during the next 50 years. And she uh, wrote from her heart about what Jesus wanted for his people. And she began mentioning that these Sabbath-keeping Adventists had the characteristics of the church, the seventh church. Even more than the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia. It was the church of Laodicea. It was lukewarm. 
and there was no vital energy. And so she wrote about these kinds of things to those Adventist believers, the Millerites, the followers of William Miller, and as they, as they read and studied this, you know, Jesus said in his message to the Seventh Church, he had used words like, lukewarm, I am rich, increased with good, I have need of what? I don't need anything, I have need of nothing. And so, they began to see that that really applied not just to the non-Sabbath-keeping Adventists, but even to them. And so, spirituality declined. Not everybody was interested in the regrowth of spirituality in the church. Let's read that message to the seventh church. It's in Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. And to the church, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who, who is that referring to Jesus to? It refers to Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus is saying this to this church. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father in, on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So at the end, near the end of testimony number one, Mrs. White pressed her appeal home with phrases that referred to this seventh, the message to the seventh church. Um, it did warm some people's hearts. It did energize a few, but for the vast majority, there really wasn't a great change. Um, and then she had another testimony, a testimony number two that came, uh, I believe, that same year. And she talked about the sin that was happening in Adventist families. They were conforming to the world. And, um, and the people of Battle Creek, as they read this testimony, they said, you know, this needs to go before more people. And they paid to have that one sent out uh, to the members that were scattered around New England in that part of the country. Uh, but it also had limited immediate results. It was in October of that year that uh, James White launched a closely reasoned series of articles in the review, and he showed convincingly how the messages of truth, the Sabbath, this condition of people in death, the sanctuary, and these basic truths, how they were based upon Bible teachings, Bible teachings alone. And, and, uh, and actually, it seemed to have a warmth, warming effect to the church and he even put in things about the, the church of Laodicea. And he felt prompted that he must begin publishing more of what Ellen White had to say in her visions, the testimonies that she gave. Uh, over the next few months, 300 letters came in thanking Elder White for speaking out and expressing humility and rededication and a genuine revival began 
and many victories were achieved. Well, Ellen White's role in this renewal was significant. Her testimonies paved the way for it. As she and her husband traveled, more visions came, and they adapted this Laodicean message uh, to the needs of the groups that they spoke to. I want to share a story that comes out of that time. It was in the year 1856. Some of the ministers had gone back to farming and pursuing carpentry and other skills. In fact, uh, some of the Adventists had moved from the uh, New England states, from Maine and New Hampshire and, and those New England states, and moved to what they had heard were the fertile fields of the West. And uh, they, uh, some of them had gathered in Wacon, Iowa. It was a, a rich farmland and, and a prosperous city. And so a number of them moved there. Uh, in fact, a couple of Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, or Sabbath-keeping Adventists, before they were known as Seventh-day Adventists, Jan Lofro was one of them, and Elder Mead was another. Uh, they moved to walk on Iowa also and took up careers working as carpenters and uh, doing rather well. And Ellen White had a burden for the church in walk on Iowa. It was a burden that just wouldn't lift. Well, it was getting to be winter time. It was coming into December. And, uh, you know, snows were beginning to fall. How could they get there? She just felt this overwhelming burden that she had to go and reach out to these people, to these ministers that had left their preaching, left uh, their ministry, and she just felt burdened that she had to do that. I want to share a few gems, and this comes from the book that Arthur White wrote uh, of the history of his grandmother. Um, Satan's snare must be broken. These precious souls rescued. Ellen says, my mind could not be at ease until we had decided to visit them. Well, how would they get there? <laughs> it meant traveling on those roads, either by horseback, carriage, or sleigh. Well, it had begun snowing. It was cold out. And so they set out uh, traveling along uh, in a sleigh. And it had snowed, but it had then began to rain. And the roads became slushy, and they... they, they their travel was slowed way down. They were headed toward the Mississippi River. And the river had frozen, but it really wasn't frozen solid. And with all the rain, there was water flowing over the ice. And they didn't know what to do. Uh, they stopped with some believers before they got uh, to, uh, to the Mississippi River. They'd either have to cross it by boat or by um, uh, sleigh. And there was no bridges going across the river in that day. And so Brother Hart, who was one of the uh, men that was traveling with them, he said, Sister White, what about Wacon? I said, shall we go? And yes, if the Lord works a miracle, we can go. So many times that night, Ellen looked out the window watching the weather about daybreak, there was a change, and it commenced snowing. The next evening, about 5 o'clock, we started on our way to walk on. Brothers Ebert and Hart, my husband and myself, and then they got to Greenvale, Illinois, and they held some meetings there. They, they stayed there. They had a severe snowstorm that struck that delayed them for nearly a week. But on Monday, December 15. They were able to begin their journey again. As they approached the Mississippi River, they had to make some, uh, make some decisions. They made inquiries about the safety of going across the river. You see, there was ice on the river, but there was water flowing over the top of the ice. And there was a slushy snow mix that was on top of there. Was it safe to go across? Most said no. It would not be safe to go across. And... Um, uh, so, finally, as they prayed about it, Ellen recounted 
the breathtaking experience. When we came to the river, Brother Hart rose in the sleigh and said, Is it Iowa or back to Illinois? She, we answered, Go forward, trusting in Israel's God. We ventured upon the ice, praying as we went. We were carried safely across, and as we ascended the bank on the Iowa side of the river, we united in praising the Lord. A number of persons told us after we had crossed that no amount of money would have tempted them to venture upon the ice, and that several teams had broken through, the drivers barely escaping with their lives. So it was still a number of miles uh, for them to go. Uh, they did stop in Dubuque uh, for a while, and <clears throat> then, um, then the cold set in, and it got colder and colder. Uh, Ellen White was managed uh, one evening to get off a few words. Uh, in the deep snow, as they traveled along, there were places there was no broken trail, and the horses had to plod through the snow. Uh, it was so cold that they would look at each other, uh, Brother Hart and Elder White and Sister White, and, and they would look at each other, Brother Hart, you need to rub your nose, it's freezing. And another would look and see the ears were getting all pale. And he said, you know, rub your ears, they're freezing. It was so bitter cold as they traveled. Can you imagine traveling? I mean, we don't get that kind of cold here. But um, traveling along through, Ellen White penned a few words to her children and said, you should be grateful for your warm home. And uh, so, in fact, she said, one night we slept in an unfinished uh, chamber where there was an opening for the stovepipe running through the top of the house, a large space big enough for a couple of cats to jump out of. He could detect her, the little humor she had out of a bad situation. It was a cold and drafty room they slept in. Well, they finally arrived in Wacom. Do you think the believers there were excited to have them there? No, they weren't. You know, they were like disobedient, parent, uh, disobedient children when their parents come home, not real happy. And they knew probably they were going to be uh, reprimanded. James and Ellen White had come. And so they were not very happy that, uh, that they had arrived. Well, they went out looking for Elder Lofbro and Brother Mead. And they got word that they were working, uh, working on a store building there in Wacon and they walked up, and there was somebody working on the roof. And they called up, and they said, Is there a man here by the name of Hosea Mead? Yes, he's up here working with me. Brother Mead recognized the voice. That's El Elon Evers' voice. And he came and looked down, and they said, Brother and Sister White are here, and Brother Hart are out here, and in the sleigh, and they want to speak to you. Well, Elder Lofbro slowly climbed down. Elder Mead came down. And Ellen White looked at him, and one of the first things she looked at Elder Lofbro, and she said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Do you remember the story of Elijah? He had preached on Mount Carmel, powerful and then, because of Jezebel's threats, he had fled for his life, and then eventually ended up in a cave, and God came to him, and he says, what doest thou here, Elijah? She used that in reference to him, and, <clears throat> and then again she said, oh, he, he says, well, I'm working with Brother Mead at carpenter work. Again, she said, what doest thou here, Elijah? And the second time. He was rather embarrassed and told what he was doing. And then a third time, she says, What doest thou here, Elijah? The whites stayed there for several days. Sabbath and Sunday, they discussed the Laodicean message. And they accepted it. Most of them did. 
Monday, they discussed the move to Battle Creek, explaining the involvements there, how the publishing house had moved there, and why it had happened. And uh, they began reestablishing confidence. At one of the meetings, Ellen White was taken off in vision, and, and she solemnly repeated the words, Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord. And they brought hope to those believers. God had not forsaken them, even though they had turned away from the calling God had given them. And even Mary Lofro, she confessed her bitterness. She had been in a, bit, in a bitter spirit because, you know, before when her husband was preaching, he often was gone from home, leaving her alone. She had become very bitter about all this work that her husband was doing and uh, leaving her alone. And she confessed her bitterness and um, gave a testimony, urging her husband to return to his ministry. Um, John Andrews was there, and he renewed his consecration to God and the service of his cough. So um, there, there was good results that came out of this uh, trip to walk on. God had directed her to be there, and James to be there as they shared this merit, uh, message. Mary later, Mary Lafro later said she had gone into, had cried out with tears, I open the door of my heart, Lord Jesus, come in. Then two testimonies came in 1857, further confirming Elder White's presentation about Laodicea. And um, Ellen White told about the rubbish that needed to be gotten rid of in members' lives. They had become bitter. They were looking at each other, complaining about the lives of others. That, you know, they thought the, when the message came, that applied to, you know, it applied to John, not me. No, it, it applied to Marlene, not, not us. Differences with their brothers and sisters, the love of material things, extravagance in their style of living, evil tempers, and um, her attention was also called to the promises to Laodicea. She began to realize that not only was the message to Laodicea a scolding message, but it was a message, a pleading message from Jesus. And it had precious promises in it. Jesus said in that, in that message, and she saw in vision, I will come to him and I will sup with him and he with me. I'll dine. We'll dine together. In truth, the letter to Laodicea is rich with promises and with the presence of Jesus. And so... These self-deceived Laodiceans saw their true condition, that they were lukewarm, that they thought that they were rich and increased with goods without any other need, but that Jesus was knocking at their door. Remember we read in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, what? If anyone hears and what? Opens the door. You see, Jesus says, I am too much of a gentleman. I will not force my way in. You must open the door. Jesus says, even my lukewarm people, if you'll open the door, I will come in to you. And so... There was something for them to do. God in, required that they had to be open to his presence and his coming into their lives and into their hearts. Um, one of the visions that Ellen White had, she saw two groups of Sabbath keepers responding to the message, this Laodicean message, in two different ways. One group was indifferent and careless. She says, the angels of God left these people. 
The other group was accepting it, and eagerly they cleared way of the rubbish, but not in their own strength. They agonized in prayer for God's strength, and they obtained the victory. Overcoming criticism, selfishness, and suspicion, they marched in perfect order, organized like an army. They were filled with the latter rain, and they witnessed to the world with phenomenal success. Then, and they soon welcomed them because they were expecting to soon welcome Jesus at his second coming. What a wonderful opportunity. And so there, there was a revival, at least a partial revival that resulted from all this. They met in their kitchens. They met in their barns. They met in their little churches. Sabbath keepers confessed hard feelings to each other. Parents and children uh, came together, um, forgiving each other. Brothers and sisters in the church. People began to sacrifice of their, uh, of their uh, financial uh, means. And, and the debt was lifted from the, the publishing house. In fact, they came to have a rather good surplus. Messages were sent out. Books were published. And um, Laodiceans, repentant Laodiceans, surrendered to the Lord and rejoiced in a new way of life, anticipating and praying for what the Bible said was the latter rain. Maybe they had a little taste of it. Some things began to change, but it didn't happen as quickly as they wished it would. Many members remained indifferent, and others asked, why don't brother and sister so-and-so change their way of life? Others insisted on their independence and refused to trust leadership. The lighter rain tarried, and even the more earnest ones, having made a few things right, felt that they had gone far enough, and they had done enough. Then in a vision on Ju July 15 of 1859, um, God revealed what had gone wrong. She was shown that God was not going to accomplish in just a prayer meeting or in a series of a few weeks or even a few months his final work. It was going to be an ongoing work. How long it would go, he did not reveal. It seems that God purposely waited for the excitement to wear down in order to allow his people to act on principle rather than feeling. Isn't that how God works? Doesn't he want us to make decisions based upon principle rather than just that momentarily uh, inspiration that comes and only lasts for a few short weeks or months? Ellen White explained, lest his people should be deceived in regard to themselves, he gives them time for the excitement to wear off and then proves them to see if they will obey the counsel of the true witness. Well, apparently, God didn't get that work finished then. You know how I know? We're still here. And I want you to know that God has not yet given up on us. Just like the Israelites coming out of Egypt. And they turned against God's leadership, God's leading. And they wouldn't follow into Canaan immediately as God wanted them to do. They doubted. And God sent them back out into the wilderness for 40 years. Guess what God did? He stayed with them through 40 years of rebellion. Isn't God good? God was good then, and God is good now. Because he still wants to finish that work in us. These seventh day Sabbath-keeping Christians, no, now known as Seventh-day Adventists. His work is not yet completed with us either. And um, as we study in these coming weeks uh, the, how our fundamental Bible teachings were developed, 
and discovered, I hope that you'll take opportunity to learn too that God has a work to complete in your heart and in mine. God hasn't given up on this. We may be lukewarm. We may think we're rich and increased with good, but God has not given up on us. He says, buy of me gold. Buy ISAV without money. Accept what I want to give you. And he has given us this message. We are the church of Laodicea. But Jesus still claims us as his people. Even though we are lukewarm, even though sometimes we are rather revolting to him, he still keeps calling us to make decisions for him. Father in heaven, we thank you that not only in the history of your people in scripture, but in the history of your people in these last hundred years, 200 years, that you have been patient with us, that you still long for us to eagerly share your truth. Help us as we rediscover the Bible truths founded on Scripture as we allow them to do a work in us to revive us and to share, we pray that you'll do that and that you'll forgive us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.